Right, I'll, I'll start now. So just a, an intro at the beginning. Um, the idea is I'm gonna, a lot of people know sort of the rules um, and some of the legislation that's already been implemented. So the idea is that I'm gonna sort of whiz through um, some of the legislation and go into a little bit of detail um, based on sort of the questions that we're being asked um, on a constant basis. Um, as I said, put your, your questions through the chat and please bear in mind that we've taken a lot of information from a lot of people um, and some of this is purely our interpretation of the legislation, interpretation of what um, the government have been saying um, and our spin on what we think is going to happen. Um, and I will explain what is legislation as we go through it and what we think is our interpretation and what you should do um, regarding that. So, the objectives of this presentation, um, prepare you for the challenges, what the support the government has put forward, what you need to do regarding maintaining your cash flow and obviously how to move your business forward. What we've done is, just to show you the breadth of questions that we've been getting from clients, um, I'm not going to go through all of these, but these are sort of the questions that we're being asked on a on an hourly basis, um, and we're finding that the same theme of question is is coming up. So I thought we would cover a lot of those through the presentation, and I think we have covered a lot of the questions that people are asking. So they're just to the flavour some of the questions. As you can see, most of them are about the job retention scheme how it works, how it's going to be implemented, how it's going to be policed, lots of questions, which we'll go into a little bit more detail as I go through the presentation. So just briefly, how long do we think this is going to last? Everyone's on the presumption that it's going to take three months for us to get through um, back to some sort of normality. And I think it's going to be another three months after that, getting out the other side. So I'm telling clients to sort of plan for six months at a minimum throughout their business and put things in place that will get them through to the end of the summer. Um, and also we just, our role here is just to keep an eye on what the government is saying on an ongoing basis. It doesn't help that they announce things at half past five on a Friday afternoon. So you can imagine the emails at the weekend and trying to deal with it yesterday um, was quite overwhelming. So uh, I would imagine to expect we're going to get another announcement Friday afternoon at 5.30. So you do need to, bit to bear with us. We're trying to communicate as quickly as possible via um, email and social media. We will be doing... Um, right, so, yeah, someone's just put in that we are recording this presentation and it will be emailed um, later this afternoon. So no need to take notes and you will have this full presentation as well. Um, yeah, so we're going to, if, when there's a major announcement, we're going to, in the next morning, is put an email out, obviously trying to explain the announcement and how interpretation, and obviously if it's a real major um, announcement, we're going to do a webinar similar to this um, and explain in a little bit more detail and deal with people's Q&A, um, which seems to work much better than trying to deal with loads of emails and phone calls. And obviously we will deal with them on, a, on an ongoing basis. So some of the main areas, I'm going to whiz through this because I'm sure all of you are aware of all of these um, measures that the government put in place. Um, and I'm going to talk about these in more detail as we go through the presentation. So as we thought that this will be the important one to start with, that we thought we would um, talk about the job retention scheme and how it works and what's involved with it. So. As you can see there, there's this new word that someone's created called furloughed, and we did find a definition of it. Um, can't remember what it is, I think it's Dutch for um, putting somebody on leave, um, but um, that's what they've been classed as, as furloughed workers. And we're getting so many questions about how this is gonna work in practical terms, and hopefully we've covered how this is gonna work in this presentation. So. You've got to go through your employee list and you've got to designate who are those that are going to be furloughed workers. And the important thing is workers. So they have to be on the PAYE. They have to be on your payroll. So casual workers, self-employed people are not covered by this. There is 
um, an indication that over the next few days that there will be some um, help for those self-employed and the freelance guys. But as of yet, there has been no announcement and we've, we think there might be something which is further on in the, in the presentation. The important thing is, and you've got to be so aware of this, that you need to notify your employees and you're actually changing the status of your employees um, subject to their existing employment law. So you are <laughs> looking at changing their contract. So you've got to negotiate with your employees and be very careful from an HR point of view what you're doing. If you are reducing pay because you're not going to pay them 100%, You've got to be so careful and I would, without doubt, get legal advice on how that would work in, um, in practical terms. So the idea of the furlough is that you, you're not laying staff off and making them redundant. The idea is to keep them on, but you will continue to pay them and recover 80% of that cost up to £30,000 per annum. So in practical terms, you would pay them their salary and through this new rebate system, that. Um, HMRC are putting together, you will claim 80% of the cost. And I've got an example later on showing how that would work in practical terms. Um, again, the employee remains employed as an employee. And this is really important. It's up to you as the employer, whether you choose to fund the difference between this payment and your salary. So for example, someone's on a 60,000 pound salary, Obviously, it's nowhere near the two and a half grand. It's up to you whether you pay them their full salary or you pay them up to the um, two and a half thousand pound, 30,000 pound a year um, cap limit. Now, what we don't know, um, and we've had this, um, we, we can't seem to get this verified whether it's the, gro the it, we know it's the gross salary, but we're not sure if the gross salary would include bonuses and overtime um, because in the legislation, we think that they would have said basic pay if they meant their basic salary. So again, we've got to look out for the detail once it's announced um, from the government. Some information, so the idea is that HMRC or the government are working to put together software to enable you to claim the rebates. Now, you and I know that these type of programs um, when they're announced take between a year and 18 months to get live and up up and working so what they're trying to do within a year 18 months they're trying to do within weeks so no wonder it's going to take a while to get up and running however we've been told from HMRC the government that it will be up and running by the end of April you should be able to submit your claims and get your 80% refunds so this is the reimbursed 80% up to a cap of two and a half grand. Um, existing systems, you can't do it through the PAY system um, because it's just not able to deal with the rebate system. And as I said, it's, it's up for three months and it will be reviewed at a later date. So again, this is one of the questions about um, backdating to the 1st of March. Um, what, you, what you've got to be very careful is that obviously if you put somebody on leave back from the 1st of March and you've kept them on, then this scheme is meant to protect those. It's not meant to protect those that you've already made redundant between the 1st of March and the 20th of March. You can't go back and, and get them back on and through this system. Um, again, as you can see, further guidance will be forthcoming on this because there's going to be big issues regarding that. Is employee... And we're getting this question all the time. Is the employer obligated to make the 20%, make up the 20% of wages lost by staff who are paid under the scheme? So again, this is not completely clear and we've interpreted what's been said, um, but our initial view is that employees do not have to pay the 20%. Um, otherwise, it defeats the whole object. So if someone is working, the good example there, if a factory engages 500 staff all on national minimum wage, the cost per month will exceed £100,000, the extra 20%. So they're obviously, that's not the point, is that the idea is to help the employer from a cash flow point of view. However, if you are obviously paying a, a, a lower salary to your employees, you're varying their contract and you've got a whole load of employment law issues that you would need to take advice on. I wouldn't just go ahead 
and blatantly cut everyone's salary by 80% or even further um, without consulting somebody. So be really careful with that. Again, we'll know more when details have been um, given out. Um, and the, they've got the two and a half grand a month, which is gross um, above, uh, based on um, the average income in the UK. Again, employees can top up salaries if they choose to. So if they do want to pay somebody on their full five grand a month salary, they're more than welcome to, but will only be getting a cap of two and a half grand back as a rebate. Great question here that somebody raised um, recently. Can employees bring staff back into the scheme and if they're already on sick leave? Um, our view is that they can, provided it's clear they are, that they are well enough. Um, it's clear that if they were well, they would have no work to do. Um, we believe the schemes only tend to be applicable where employers have no work to give to staff. So what I thought we'd do is, is, is a really nice example that we've seen um, <clears throat> being published of how this will work practically in the long term. So we've got an employee who is on a two and a half thousand pound gross salary. Obviously there's national insurance and apprenticeship levy if applicable and employers pension contributions. You can see that the 80% grant, well, they will receive 2,000 pounds back against the two and a half. And because of all the other costs, the cost of the company per month is actually 817 pounds. So you just bear, bear in mind, that's how the calculation works going forward. So the two and a half is based, the 80% is based on the gross salary of two and a half. What we're not sure is how this two and a half um, works and how, if whether, um, hold on, let me just move something there. Um, a monthly grant of two summer earnings and two and a half, yeah. So we just, we're interpreting the rules and this is the, the guide that we think is going to work and how it's going to be implicated. So the, what a lot of people now are doing is working out. So if 80% of the salary is two and a half grand, the full salary would be 3125. So if that figure there was 3125, 80% of that would be two and a half. So you're maximizing the grant, but obviously you've got all the employers' national insurance and the pension contributions costs that you still would need to pay. So basically anyone over 37 and a half grand, you've got to make that decision whether you're going to pay them the full salary or whether you're going to go up to the two and a half grand limit. Again, we get in this all the time um, regarding company directors. So we found something on accounting web um, only yesterday, late yesterday evening, there was a conversation between a, an employment law barrister um, and the, the guy on LBC about one man bank companies and whether they would be entitled to the um, furlough 80% rebate. So as you can see that most company directors were on a small salary up to their either national insurance limit or personal allowance limit and obviously taking the rest by dividends. At that time was good tax planning, <laughs> obviously not foreseeing that this was gonna happen. So as long as that director is furloughed himself and is unable to work, i.e. the business is shut down um, and he's not able to work and do any work for the company, then he should be able to claim the 80%. What I wouldn't suggest is to go back um, to the payroll and start amending payroll that has already been submitted to HMRC. Um, it's very easy for them to see payrolls being amended because of RTI where a monthly return is now submit submitted. If it would look very strange that for 10 months you're on 800 or pounds a month, and then on month 11 February, it's gone up to two and a half grand to claim this rebate. Um, very easy for the revenue to spot it, very easy for the revenue to then come after you for um, any interest penalties and so forth. So, and I don't think that really was in the spirit of um, why these rules were brought into place. So that's our understanding. Again, we're not 100% sure if directors are included, can't see why not. However, you must follow the rules at the bottom that those employees must, be, the directors must be furloughed. So if you still continue to trade, still trying to drum up business, you're still working, then you're not going to be entitled to it. So this is an example letter that 
we've seen um, around, so this is being given to us by um, somebody as an example that you can use when you give it to your employees. As you can see, there's a big health warning, run past this your HR specialist. I would not want to do this without getting some HR advice and, and employment advice before you start giving these very strong letters to your employees. But it's, it's the start and it's something that you should do and you have to do before you um, furlough your employees. And they need to be obviously notified in writing um, and obviously it's very clear on the government's website that you're changing their employment rights and should get legal advice. We will be sending a Word document out following this um, webinar for you to maybe take this to your HR but, um, for advice, but as you've got something you can work with going forward. Um, very conscious that we're getting very close to the end of March and people need to be paid their wages. Right, so what I'm going to do is going to look at some of the questions because we're just about finished on, um, I'm going to go back to the slides because I don't want to dump the gun on that. So there's some questions here, um, which maybe I haven't covered. So <clears throat> do furloughed workers still pay tax and NI? Yes, they would. And you will still pay the PAYE. And obviously at the moment you should be negotiating with HMRC to maybe defer PAYE for the next couple of months. And they seem to be um, taking a, a light touch and agreeing sort of any payment plans at the moment. Um, so we've got, would there be any, any disadvantages to changing all staff to furloughed? Again, you've got to comply with the rules that you, they actually are not working and have stopped working. So if you have shut the office and you want to retain them, then yes, you can furlough those guys. I'm going to have to come back to you. Uh, I'm going to have to come back to, to Jonathan on the people that you've made redundant. Um, we'll make a note of that and, and come back to you. Um, again, it's so difficult because we've got no detail of how this works um, practically. So um, we're making a note of that. So yeah, the scheme starts from the 1st of March. So the idea is that from the 1st of March, if anyone had been laid off back from the 1st of March, they're in the scheme. So for example, I've had a lot of clients say to me, right, they're paying everybody up to this month as normal because they're still working, but from the 1st of April, they're gonna furlough them because they know from the 1st of April, there's gonna be no work. So if you were furloughing them today, then obviously you'll pay them three weeks full pay and then a week at the furlough rate that you've agreed with them. Um, yes, yeah, so if, our staff on minimum wage, can we pay them 80% of that? Yes. Yeah, so it's all wages. You, they, it's not you, right, so you're not paying them 80%. So you have to pay them 100% of their wages. So you've got to pay them full pay and you claim 80% back from the government. All right, so it's not paying them 80%. They get full pay as, as normal. It's what you reclaim, hopefully by the end of April when the systems are up and running. So I employed someone who only started on the 2nd of March. Again, we don't know. So there's been talk about people being on the payroll at the end of February will be entitled to this. There's been talk that you've got to be working for the company for three months before you're entitled to this. We do not know the criteria for when people are entitled to it. So the question about if they started on the 2nd of March and you're now making them furlough, we don't know. We don't know if, <laughs> if it, the criteria for when someone's going to be furloughed. We think it's going to be if you're on the payroll at the end of Feb, and we think that you needed to be on the payroll for maybe two or three months. Again, we don't know until the detail comes out. So unfortunately, I can't really answer that one. Right, I, David, I'll come back to you because that's a long email and <laughs> maybe Paul might help me on that one. Um, Yes, yes, um, Vincent, I would, I, would, I would send that letter to yourself as a director of that company because HMRC are gonna to want to see evidence that you furloughed yourself 
and that company is now not trading. So if you've offered, if you've done job offers, the same principle applies. Were they employed at the end of Feb? If they're employed at the end of Feb, then you can furlough them. The idea is that otherwise, if you're then putting everybody, you're taking everybody on and furloughing them now, then it's, it's open to abuse. But again, we'll know more of the details. Right, so Claudine, um, this, the software should be up and running. Um, the software should be up and running by the end of April. Um, your, your guess is good as mine, whether it be up and running by then. To be honest, I don't think it will be by the end of April. I think it'd be the end of May, which is then really difficult because you're going to have to fund two months' wages before you get your rebate. But I, I, I've been assured that they're working day and night to get the software up and running. Right, maternity leave. Yeah, we, we did. We, before this presentation, we looked at maternity leave and we found it a complete minefield. Um, you really need to speak to someone on HR on the maternity. Um, it was hard enough trying to work out if they're on sick pay and then trying to work out maternity was really difficult. I'm sorry, I can't answer that one. Um, can you choose to top someone's salary up and not someone else if they do the same role? <sighs> I would say. I would say yes, but you're then running a huge HR issue. Um, you need to take HR advice. Um, and to be honest, they're only going to bloody say the same thing as us. We don't know the detail. So um, a great question. Um, and I haven't been asked that one before, but yeah, I would. I know I'm passing the buck to the HR guys, but you, you do need to speak to them. Okay, cool. If the employees ask to work from home, but they are still working, does this scheme apply? Definitely not. 100% not. That is not what it's meant to do. It's, a co it's not a coincidence that after this was announced, that all the shops, all the high street shops shut from Friday, Friday evening and over the weekend and today and yesterday. So they've obviously taken the view that we're going to furlough all our employees and get the 80% the rebate, um, obviously, the, the, the lockdown obviously didn't help either. No, you can you can offer redundancy. You, you can still do the redundancy route. The idea is that the government don't want people, if they don't have to, to go down the redundancy route, if they still think there's a business there after three or four months, that they want to keep the staff and don't want to make them redundant. But you can still, if you if you want to, if, if the business can't sustain the, the number of employees. Right, I'm going to have to move on because believe it or not, I've got 42 more messages that have come through and I could be here all day. So what Paul's gonna do is just go through and pick out some of those um, messages as we go through um, and try and answer the ones that I haven't actually gone through. Let me go, sorry, let me just go on here. Right, should be able to scroll down. So support for the self-employed, this was, um, announced, well not announced, this was um, discovered by somebody in the office today and I think few, quite a few people have emailed it to us. It looks quite official from the committee of the whole house, um, dated yesterday um, and if you read there it looks like that the self-employed are going to have some help um, as employees are at the moment. So again, this is nothing being announced, this has not been put in the press but it looks like the self-employed freelancers, the casual workers are going to get some sort of um, rebate. And as you can see there, it's going to be 80% of their monthly net earnings averaged over the last three years or just under three grand, obviously, whichever it is, the lower. So again, we'll see, we'll see how that pans out over the next few days. But there's good news that somebody is actually aware that we need to do something to do help the self-employed. So that's really to do, that's really I've covered the furlough. So I'm going to answer some of the questions towards the end. I think so. I'm, I've got quite a few more slides to get through. Um, I will try and go back and catch up at the end, which would be quite good. If you guys are willing to stay on, they're more than willing to stay on, or go to the end of the recording and see what the the answers are to some of the questions. Deferring VAT and income tax payments. Um, this is quite nice from um, a cash flow point of view that um, HMRC will now defer all um, 
VAT payments that were due between now and the end of June and um, do not need to make these payments um, until the 5th of April 2021, which is a, a nice holiday. Um, however, it comes with a massive health warning that if you can pay it and you have the funds, I would suggest you would pay it. If you're not sure and you think you would need the, the funds um, to help your cash flow, then personally, I would actually put it into a, a savings account. I would actually put it into another bank account um, and let it sit there and only dip into it if you really, really need to. Because with all these deferral schemes, um, you can imagine as we come out of this problem that the cash flow <laughs> and requirements are going to be massive. Um, and what we don't want to see is businesses really struggling at the end. Um, they've got through the six months, but they can't then pay the deferred VAT or the PAYE and so forth. So you've really got to manage your cash flow um, really well. Income tax. Now, again, this is really important. It only applies to those self-employed. It doesn't apply to directors who have taken dividends and have payments on account January and July. It doesn't apply to those who have got buy to lets. Um, it's only for those that are self-employed. So beware that you still might have your July 2020 payment to make. However, obviously, I would guess many people will be phoning HMRC and deferring that where possible. Um, the idea of, of this is that it, they didn't want a, everyone calling HMRC for deferment um, arrangements. The idea was that to free up HMRC's um, hotline and if anyone has tried to speak to them um, the last I heard is a two-hour wait to actually speak to somebody so the idea is that you don't need to worry about the VAT and income tax because it's all been agreed going forward. SSP um, to employees so this has helped a lot of obviously employers can pay the two weeks SSP which is £94.25 a week um, and the employers, as long as they've got less than 250 employees, are eligible to claim back the SSP through the POI scheme. So that's good news for, for people who can survive on 94 quid a week. Um, and it's good news for the employers because you can obviously reclaim the SSP back, which previously any sort of, any apart from, well, I don't think anyone could um, claim back SSP um, until now. And there's some, some information about um, the compliance of how you go, go about dealing with the SSP. Um, this is all to do with business rates. Um, this is all sort of quite old, old news now, believe it or not. It's only, <laughs> it's been out a week and it seems like <laughs> this has been out for ages. Um, but all I would say is that anything to do with the rates, any, any um, deferment or any refunds, are all going to be dealt with by the local authority. So unfortunately, um, you're in their hands and for them to process everything rather than you contacting them. Um, but the, you can see there that there's a business rates holiday for if you're in the retail, hospitality and leisure business. So you will have no rates to pay for the next year. Um, and there's obviously big discounts for um, smaller companies. And that's what you need to do if, to become eligible for it. So they're giving out cash grants, actually putting 25 grand into your bank account if you meet, meet certain criteria. Um, and that's if you're in the retail, hospitality, and leisure sector and your rateable value is between 15,000 and 151,000 pounds, you will receive that grant of 25 grand, as well as not paying any rates for next year, which is a really big help um, for you when it happens. The problem is, is no one will know when that's going to actually happen and when the money is actually going to hit your bank account um, where you've got bills to pay, employees to pay and mortgages to pay. Very difficult, but that's the rules at the moment and people are working within those rules. If your rateable value is under £15,000, you will receive a grant of £10,000. At the budget, that was £3,000 and with everything that's going on, that have increased that to £10,000. Again, you've got to wait for your local authority to write to you um, and they will tell you whether you're um, eligible for this grant. If you don't have, um, you don't pay any, any rates or you're a small, small business because of the small business rate relief, 
you will also get a one-off grant of £10,000 to help meet those ongoing costs. Once again, the local authority will let you know. Right, so we're getting loads of information, regard, uh, asked, being asked lots of information regarding the business interruption loan scheme. You wouldn't believe it, but um, all the banks got um, told at four o'clock last night how this scheme will actually work. So obviously um, we're working, trying to interpret what the rules are, but the main point that has come out is that this is that the lending will be on any other bank lending. They're not relaxing any of the lending rules or criteria. Um, your business still needs to meet the British Business Bank eligibility criteria. So on the next slide, you will see that what that means and what information you need to supply <coughs> to the bank. It's not a matter of speaking to your bank, I need a 50 grand loan and within a week your loan hits your bank account. It just does not happen. They've, they've still got to assess the business, they still got to see if it's viable going forward, and they still need loads of information to process those loans. The difference is, is that if you can't put, put up the security, the government will step in and secure that loan. You will see here, this is from Barclays Bank that we got last night. This is their criteria and they will not process the application without all of this information. So you can see it's still a bit of work to do. There's still a lot of information they require. They need forecasting, they need management accounts, they need last three years accounts. They need a lot of information um, to, to assess the loan. So how quickly they will move, I've got no idea because in the past it will take four to six weeks to get the loan proce processed and the funds released. Um, you can imagine how many applications the banks are dealing with um, at the moment, if you can actually get hold and speak to somebody, but it's obviously gonna help your business going forward. Right, so time to pay service, um, very simple. Um, HMRC have got a dedicated helpline the, the numbers on the screen for you to call. They will look at each case by case and, and base um, their decisions speaking to you. I'm hearing that very quickly they will obviously defer, they'll, they'll defer tax for three months. You could get six months if, if you're lucky, um, but you really should be speaking to them and just not paying it uh, because then it's obviously on your file and there shouldn't be any penalties um, uh, yeah, any pen, there shouldn't be any pen, penalties um, and interest as well, as long as you get it all agreed with them. <clears throat> so, on the time to pay service, which is someone has just asked, is that you've got to submit your VAT return as normal. You need to submit your PAYE return, CIS return, tax returns as normal. But what you've got to do is a lot of people now pay their VAT um, and POA on direct debit. You need to stop the direct debit and then contact HMRC and tell them that you want time to pay. Otherwise, if you don't stop the direct debit and the systems can't cope, they will just take that money out automatically. So I would definitely um, do that as, as a matter of course um, before you speak to them. So this small, um, we've got a small business emergency action plan that we'll be sending to you, um, which gives you lots of information to help you get through this. Also, um, it goes without saying that I think if per, from a personal point of view, you should speak to your mortgage company and defer the mortgage payments for three months. Every bank is dealing with it differently. I know Barclays are sending texts to customers saying, please don't get in contact with us will contact you within seven to 10 days. Some, uh, um, for example, I know Skipton Building Society, you've got to email a dedicated email address they, with your explanation of why you're deferring it and they will take between five and seven days to come back with the decision. So even if you, you don't think you need to defer your mortgage payments, I think it will be a good time to do it now um, we don't know if the mortgage companies or the banks have got 
um, a, a target that they can't defer any more. So if you leave it to the last minute, they might turn around and say, no, we can't do any more. Um, and I, again, I would put the money aside into a separate bank account um, if you can afford to. So then you've got that money um, to use going forward. The idea is also the banks will then just roll up the interest for the three months. And when you then start paying again, you will pay a slightly higher amount um, going forward, but obviously it helps your cash flow. Negotiate with your suppliers, negotiate with all of them as much as you can. Contact your landlord. So this is really important that I think yesterday it was announced that um, commercial landlords cannot evict anybody for not paying their rent for three months, which is in line with the residential market. So where maybe you have approached your landlord already and they've basically come back and told you to F off, you can now go back to them and go back to them and, and negotiate with them a lot harder now because they cannot evict you for three months. Um, so that would maybe help you going forward. Again, the same with your rates, bills. If you're not in that hospitality sector and you've got big rates bills going out every month, I would stop the direct debit and I would speak to the council, the rates people and ne renegotiate your terms with them um, and help your cash flow as much as you possibly can. Regarding your cash flow, um, you need to see where you are. Some, I know some clients are looking at their cash flow on a daily basis, a weekly and a monthly basis, just to see what the impact is and where the, the, um, the, the breaking point hits. Um, you should do that as a matter of course. Again, we've got some templates that we can send you if you need them. Based on that, you can then make decisions on what your cash flow is gonna look like. So your immediate actions, so the immediate, so what we got to do straight away, so look at exactly what I've just said, do your cash flow forecast, you can make some decisions, talk to your bank, if you, if you can extend any loans, renegotiate any loans that you've got, renegotiate with your leasing companies, if you can, some of them are playing very hard um, and not sort of um, moving and helping them, but it's worth trying the bank, apply for the government bank support if necessary, if you think you can sustain the loans going forward um, and can put all that information together fairly quickly. And above all, <laughs> stay strong. Um, hopefully we, everyone can get through the next three to six months and really um, take advantage as we come out of this um, and, and grow the business back and to the levels they were before um, a, few, a few weeks ago. Get your whole team involved, talk about how you can reduce some of the costs whilst maintaining revenues. Look at those, the, your list of products and services and if any are not, not very profitable or not your core service, start looking at ways of maybe cutting those back and concentrate on those that are giving you good profits and good cash flow. Those customers are not paying you, why bother? You need to get rid and concentrate on those clients that are paying you and give them a, a great service and see if they need any help going forward. Review your debtors list. Can you use invoice discounting? Can you factor your debts? Um, some companies will do spot um, invoice factoring, invoice discounting, so you can just um, factor and sell that invoice to a factoring company. That one invoice release some cash quickly. Um, agree payment terms with all your suppliers um, and obviously build up some relationships with your better customers and hopefully get paid going forward. So we've got a huge amount of resources available, which a lot of these are gonna be sent following this presentation with, with obviously the presentation as well. Regarding the, um, the finance lending, the secure funding, we have access to over hundred lenders and we have a form that we ask people to complete to give us some information to enable us to go to those lenders um, to see if there is a, a funding um, capacity there, what the criteria is. So please use us if you are looking. So I am advising clients to go to their bank as well as us in case the bank are taking too long or the bank decide that they're not interested. And then we've got others in the background working um, to help you get that loan, to help you get through the next three to six months. So, Situation it literally is changing on a daily basis. 
Um, we're trying to keep up to date as much as we possibly can. You need to look out for our emails and follow us on all the social media platforms. As I said, we're going to be sending these emails on a daily basis when there's a major update. If there's nothing sort of major, then there's no point sort of sending an email saying nothing's changing. We'll do more of these webinars um, and deal with all the questions. How many questions have we got so far? Oh, okay. We've got, I think we've hit over 100 questions, so I'm going to try and work through them. Are we only at 20, 20 past three? Um, <laughs> know your figures. You need to get to know how, <clears throat> what your, what your um, projections are for the next three months, without a doubt, um, and, I, and, and use the support that the bank and the government are offering as much as you possibly can. Right, so I'm gonna now go through, I'm gonna go through quite a few, the questions Paul's highlighted for me that I have not covered in the presentation. So just bear with me for, for a little bit. So Julia has asked, what if staff are going to have their hours cut, but not actually being laid off? So then, yeah, you can't furlough them because yeah. you're, they're still working. So the furlough is on a complete shutdown and they are not able to work. So with that, you've got to then renegotiate their contract and get them to, to accept that they're on reduced hours. Um, it's interesting. It's quite a bit. So Kelly, I think quite a few people have asked the same question. Can staff request to opt out a pension scheme now or not back later? 100%, yeah? yeah can. They can opt out any time they want. You can't obviously force them to opt out, but yes, they can opt out. A great way for them to save a bit of money and a great way for you to save a bit of money. They obviously need to contact their pension company. You can't do it on their behalf to tell them they want to opt out. Um, and they can go straight back in it once everything hopefully gets back to normal. And that's a great question. Um, so, Melissa, could you allow staff to take holiday first to receive full payment at the moment? Yes, 100%. Agree with you. If they've got holiday, they're, then they're going to lose or want to use up 100%, get them to use their holiday, they're on full pay, then maybe the furlough kicks in. To be honest, who's going to be going away in the summer? <laughs> Everyone's Spain and Italy holidays have been cancelled. So, yes, use their holiday pay now. At least they know they're going to get full pay and, and, and let, and, until you've made that decision whether you're going to pay them full pay on the furlough or you're going to pay them the 80% amount. Um, another question. So I've got Joe. Me and my wife directors, no other staff pay ourselves. <clears throat> so we fell ourselves, where do we find how to do this online yet? So again, we're interpreting what people said and following that interview on LBC, that the barrister seems to think directors are, that you can furlough directors, but again, you have to shut the business down. You can't be continuing to work. Um, and if you can demonstrate that, to HMRC, then yes, you can furlough yourself and get the 80% of what you, you pay yourself on the salary. This one's quite a few times as well. So your point about directors on minimum wage, can you clarify, will they be able to claim up to 37 grand or only up to nine grand? So it's only up to nine grand. So if they're on minimum wage, you pay them as per normal, you pay them their normal monthly or weekly wage, you claim the 80% back of what you're paying them up to the 35 grand limit. So yeah, you can, can continue to pay them as normal. Right, so commissions, Fabrizio, we seem to think that the way the legislation was written last week, that we think commissions and overtime would be included in their gross pay because the way they worded it, if they had wanted people to be just paid their basic pay, we seem to think that they would have said their basic gross pay. Um, again, until we get the, the guidance, we don't know, but we seem to think that it would include commissions. But how you work out the commissions, whether it's the previous three months average, the six months, the year, or whatever you pay them in February, we just do not know um, until obviously the, the legislation is, is put out there. 
Right, so corporation tax return, I would definitely submit your corporation tax return and then you need to phone them up, phone HMRC up and get a time to pay arrangement agreed with them. Um, if you, what we find, what we're finding is that they will not speak to you or agree a time to pay unless you've submitted the returns because they don't know the amounts. So even if you say, yeah, my corporation tax um, liability is 10 grand, they're going to say, well, you need to submit it. We need to see that on our system before we agree time to pay. So everything needs to be submitted to, and, and for then you to then call them up. But 100% give them a call. Um, I'd be amazed if they insist on <laughs> payment for, with what's going on. Um, be quite interesting to see if that is the case. Um, then people will take... <laughs> take a, a view whether they need to submit the returns and just sit on them and don't file it and and suffer the penalties for not filing returns um but we, we shall see as clients start contacting hmrc this one how you retail leisure what's hard then no. what is available for rateable value greater than 51 grand nothing only if it's retail Hospitality leisure. Retail hospitality leisure over fifty one. I don't think there's any yeah, they get they're getting relief, but nothing. No yeah, there's else. no there's no there's no from what it was quite clear it was between twenty fifteen thousand and one and fifty one thousand and then you get the rebate. I think over and above that you don't get a rebate. Yeah, so we've been told that deferring your mortgage payments will not affect your credit rating. Um, that was quite clear when that was announced. Um, the proof of being a pudding once <laughs> once you start get uh, approaching um, uh, trying to get finance later on, but we seem to think it won't affect your credit rating. Personal car leasing payments again. I would. I would. That's really difficult because they don't have to um, do anything for you, and if you de if you default on the payment, they're just going to come and collect the car um, or any other asset. So you're really up to a bit of a um, a hard fight with the leasing companies, um, and I'd imagine that a lot of them are just taking a hard line um, and telling them that you, you need to pay. So. No, no harm trying. Deferring corporation tax, that's the same principle. You've got a time to pay arrangement. Um, you've got to make a decision. Do you submit the return? Get the time to pay arrangement or just do not submit the return and deal with the penalties for late, late filing. Um, it's up to you, but you could sort of defer your court tax that way by not filing your return um, for four to five months rather than doing a time to pay. The time to pay arrangement does help if you're in construction and you're under the growth scheme or if there's anything else that HMRC will look at if you haven't applied for the time to pay arrangements. Are we now recording? Yeah, so th this recording's been emailed as soon as we finished. Yeah, so it was really funny. So about half an hour before I did this presentation, there was a, an email from someone that we're following who's sort of quite in with the government and number 10. And she was hoping that there was something going to be announced today, but it sounds like something is imminent, um, especially of what I sort of put up on there on that slide, that something is going to happen um, very shortly, which will help the self-employed. It looks like it could be an average, 80% of the average of the three years um, tax returns or just under three grand, whatever is the lowest. So it looks like there could be help there. I'm sure we will do another webinar once we know <laughs> what the rules are. Franchise, so great question. Franchisees, separate limited companies. <coughs> if they continue running, we are ahead of us have, to, have had to stop. This is okay. Are we still eligible? If they're running. So yeah, your, your franchise companies, each one of them has to yeah, look at their, their criteria and their employees. So if, for example, if they've stopped I know running classes um, and their employees then have been sent home, then they can be furloughed or the director 
can't work, they will furlough themselves um, as long as the legislation comes, it confirms the directors are applicable. So you'd, each franchise would have to look at their own limited company in their own circumstances. So how do our POA temps fare with the furlough if the end client says that they can't carry on in their job? Would they somehow be entitled under the AWR regs? What's AWR regs? Alternative work, I don't know. How do POA temps fare with furlough if the end client says they can't carry on in their job? That's a great question. <laughs> Let's get back on that one. The problem is we don't know at what date that the you've got to be on the POA to furlough them. It depends if you, uh, yeah, oh, that's a great one on the POA on the temp. Yeah. We'll try and find that out. We'll try and find that out. But if you if you apply the same thinking that if they're furloughed and they're the problem is, will they then go out and find alternative work if there is any alternative work? They've got to be sitting at home, not doing anything. As soon as they get another job, and then the whole thing, the furlough doesn't work. Um, so, sole trader. Um, yeah, so that's a great question. Tax due in July, deferred to January. No, you don't need to notify HMRC. They've already told everybody we're deferring the July payment. So the idea was that you then don't have to call them and, and, and jam up their, their hotline. So that is 100% deferred. But again, with the VAT, if you have it, or you, if you've got the money, or you know it's going to be payable January, that January payment is going to be horrendous. It's going to be horrible because yeah. you've got Obviously, the July payment, you will have the balance to pay January, and then you will have payment on account for the following year as well. So you could potentially have three payments due January 2021. Um, so I'm, I'm sort of saying to people, if you can afford it, pay it, or if you can't, put it away. It's out of your bank account into another bank account, um, out of sight, out of mind, and then you maybe know it's, it's there for, if, you, if you need it in an emergency. But... Ideally, you want to pay the tax with it. I'm a private landlord with a mixed private commercial residential. My tenants do not pay, and I can't evict. How do I claim loss? You can't. You can't. So the only way you claim your loss of rent or income is your in your accounts is shown is obviously a bad debt. <coughs> there's no. I've seen that a few times. Yeah. That <coughs> there's no relief at all for <coughs> landlords and the way the government has treated the landlords over the last yeah. two or three years. I can't, but I'll be amazed if they do anything to help help the landlords, to be honest. But <clears throat> all you can do is speak to the mortgage company and try and defer your mortgage payments if you possibly can. Let's try and get through, still got notes. Just, got, just plowing through some, getting towards the bottom of them, still about 30 odd questions, a lot we have covered. If I, if I can't meet with my accountant, will I get a penalty for non-filing? You will still get a penalty for a non-filing. It's down to you. Now, right? I think yeah, so Company's House, if it's a limited company, Company's House have extended the filing deadline um, automatically. Um, however, with HMRC, I think you'll still get notified of a penalty if you're late filing it. Obviously, then you've got rights to appeal. Um, and then go through the appeal procedure as per normal. I'm a Morris dancer. I love that one. Grant. I'm a Morris dancer, mainly work on Isle of Man. Can I defer payments on leg straps, bells, and sticks? Well done, Grant. Thanks, Grant. I think Barry will like that one. <laughs> right, so, yes. So we've covered. A lot of the questions, um, hopefully it's been of some help. As I said, keep out an eye out for anything. Um, yeah, keep an eye out for any, any announcements going forward. I hope it's been helpful. Unfortunately, sometimes it's really hard to, to <laughs> unable to give the answers where we're just not sure what the answers are. Um, and 
I'm just going through. Um, the company's house finding deadline delays. I think it's two two months. Yeah. So the company's house finding deadline delay is two months. Um, I pay tax. Right. So yeah, if you're private landlords, yeah, you're not self as a as a private landlord. I don't think they're defining you as self-employed for the July. The only, what I was reading today is if you've got a mix of self-employed and rental income, then yeah, you might be able to. So yeah, so in the in details released so far, so I'm just reading something here. Details released so far, this seems to be a facility only available to individuals with self-employed interest on that returns um, for all individuals. Um, so hopefully it was useful. We're going to clear through some of these questions and we will actually answer some of these um, that we haven't answered as well. Um, but all thank you for listening and hope to see you soon. Thank you.